the Spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body. Good morning and welcome to worship. We're so thrilled that you've joined us this morning. We uh, are continuing our live stream this, this morning and, and we're hoping that you and your family are gathered together and, and, and worshiping with us. As um, I said uh, previously, we, we're not here uh, for you to watch. It's, it's tempting to just sit there and, and watch like we do normally on our TVs or on our computers watching videos. That's not what this is. This is participatory. We, we want you to join in. We want you to sing. Sing out loud. Uh, your family won't care. And if they do care, tell them that they don't need to care. We are the body of Christ. We may not be gathered together in one place, but we are gathered together this morning. And so we are excited about worship this morning. We worship a holy and loving God that is sovereign over all things. And this is who we worship this morning. Why don't you join me as we go to him in prayer. Father, you are the God of, of glory. You are the God of the church. You are the God uh, who is over all things. And so, Father, we lift you up and we glorify you this morning. Be glorified as, as we sing, as we teach. May your name be lifted up. You, O oh Lord, are worthy. It's in the precious name of your Son, Jesus, that perfect sacrifice that took our place and took our sins and rose again. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. A reading from Psalm 118. 
We'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes.
If you have your copy of God's Word, and we'll turn with me to Romans chapter 1, I mean Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we're going to begin in verse 1 in our reading, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We're continuing in our series of, of uh, readings uh, through Scripture, we're in the last few weeks, uh, we should wrap it up by the end of the, end of the uh, uh, month, so uh, just hang in there, keep reading, and we're continuing. We're, we'll be in uh, specific uh, scriptures throughout, uh, throughout the, the rest of the Bible. So we're in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read the first 11 verses. If you'll read along with me, the word should be up on your screen. There you go. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life is Christ Je- in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit, who lives in you. Pray with me. Father, you are a wonderful God. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word, for your word is truth. May your word fill our hearts. May your spirit lead us and guide us. And Father, I pray for those who don't know your spirit, who've never put their trust in you, your Son is Lord and Savior. Father, I pray for them that you, O oh Lord, would draw them to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In 1995, Mel Gibson premiered a film about freedom. The movie was, tells the tale of William Wallace, who united the warlords of Scotland and led them to begin their fight for freedom from the British oppression in the 13th century. There were a couple of quotes in that movie that many people will remember. 
The first one is when Wallace was riding in front of his men who were poised for a battle. And he's rallying his troops even though they are outnumbered. He says, I fight and you may die. Run and you will live at least for a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, you, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. The second quote is probably the most quoted in the movie. And uh, the movie is Braveheart, by the way. When, um, after being betrayed and captured, Wallace is about to die an awful death. And he asks to say one last word. And they grant him that privilege. And with all his strength he has left, he cries out, Freedom! Freedom is precious. In America, it's our, it's our base right. We, our, all, our whole society is based on freedom. We value our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom from tyranny, our freedom from oppression, our freedom of expression, our freedom to bear arms, our freedom, our freedom in general. And, and our Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights, are, are foundational documents granting us those freedoms. And we are a free people. But what if I told you that most of the people who believe they're, they're free in our country and even in the world really aren't free? They are under the worst form of tyranny. They're under the tyranny of sin and death. John Piper says of the passage that we just read that the greatest book in the world is the Bible and the greatest letter in that book is Romans and the greatest chapter in that letter is chapter 8. J.D. Greer says of verse 1, he says, and the best verse is verse 1. So what makes chapter great, chapter 8 so great is, is verse 1. And in chapters 1 through 7, Paul lays out a, a theology of sin and the tyranny of the law of Moses. Right, right now I need to stop and, and, and say that when we're talking about the law of God and, and the law of Moses, we're talking about God's laws that's spelled out in the first five books the Bible, of the Bible known as the books of the law or the books of the law of Moses. And these laws were given by God to show us that n- not to give us the standard to live by as much as it is to show us that we cannot live up to the standard that he has set because of his holiness. To try to live by these laws is to give ourselves over to a performance-based religion. And and performance-based religion is a religion that says, I must do to please my God. And there are plenty of performance-based religions in the world. The top three Uh, Of the top three religions, two of them are performance-based. Both Islam and Judaism are performance-based. I must, uh, in Judaism, I must keep the law. In Islam, I must keep the five pillars of of Islam. And and within Christianity, even, there are elements that attempt to take us to a performance-based religion. Catholicism, for instance, with its penance, is a fitting example. Though there are elements of performance-based religion even in our evangelicalism. So we have to separate what it means for this performance-based religion. And this passage we just read explains how you and I can gain freedom from that performance-based religion. And it also contrasts life without Christ and life with Christ. And let's unpack what we just read. And see how true freedom only comes from a life lived in Christ. As I said, verse 1, J.D. Greer said, is the greatest verse in the greatest book, uh, in the greatest chapter, in the greatest letter, in the greatest book. Verse 1, let me reread it. There is, therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. The first thing we see is, first freedom we see is that we are free from condemnation. We are free from condemnation. In chapter 7, Paul really gets into describing the effects of sin on us and and our tendency to sin. And and he doesn't leave himself out. He doesn't say, you do this or you do that. He says, it's me. It's me, even I. Sin 
the sin that I would rather not sin. In verse 19 of chapter 7, Paul writes, For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil I do not want to do. And then in verse 24, he cries out, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? So in in chapter 8, now remember, the chapter designations are not scripture. They're man-made. And so this is all one one flows right in from chapter 7. And it says that we are free. It has this therefore. It begins with therefore, which points back to this chapter 7, this confession of sin in Paul's life, this confession of, of not being able to follow the law, this confession of a law that is, that is so high of standard that no one can follow it. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation. We are free from our penalty of sin. We are free from condemnation. We are free from our penalty for our sin. You know, condemnation is a legal term. And it means the act of condemning someone as a punishment. Or to a punishment. Now, you know, what freedom? There's no punishment for our sin. Imagine sitting on death row for years knowing that you will die because of what you have done. Imagine the warden coming and unlocking your cell and telling you that you're free to go and you never have to fear condemnation again because of what you have done. Wouldn't you be overjoyed? But there's a caveat to that no condemnation clause. It says, therefore, now there is no condemnation For those in Christ Jesus, it's only for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, we're going to look later at the specifics of what it means to be in Christ. But for now, let me just say that not everyone will escape the judgment of their sin. Only those who have trusted Christ for for their forgiveness will know the freedom of no condemnation. So why is that? Why can we say that it's only those who have put their trust in Christ? We see that in our second freedom. We are free because of Christ. We are free because of Christ. We see that in verse 4. Because, it says, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We're not under condemnation because the life in Christ has set us free. So many of us try to live so that we can deserve what Christ died to give us. We try to live up to those standards, that performance-based religion. You can't do it. We will not face condemnation, not because of our good, but because God condemned sin on us by sending Christ, who was like us in every way except he didn't sin. He sent him to the cross. He became our sin offering He paid the price for our sin. He was our substitute. You remember my illustration of being free on death row and the warden set you free. You wondered, well, what happened? How did this happen that I've I've gone free? You find, you just found out was that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin with his death. He paid that death penalty. This is how he became your sin offering. J.D. Greer, when he preached on this chapter, said, Suppose I run up this huge electric bill because I like the air conditioner set on 55 degrees all summer. And, And the electric company sends the bill, this huge bill, and my wife pays it. And then a couple days later, I get a phone call on my cell phone. And the electric company is coming after me to pay the same bill. All I need to do is show them that where my wife has already paid the bill, it is already paid in full. It's the same type of illustration with Christ. We no longer have to fear condemnation because the price is paid in full. Now here's the thing about Jesus paying your bill. He paid not only for your past sins, but for your future sins. 
How can you know that? How can you know that he did that? So let me ask you a question. When Jesus died on the cross, how many sins had you already committed? Uh, You weren't even born yet, so the answer is none. So when he died on the cross, he died for all your sins. He died on the cross so you could live. And his death fulfilled the laws and and, and requirements for us. Those that walk in the Spirit just means those that gave God's Holy Spirit, that have God's Holy Spirit in them. We also see that we're free to live. We are free to live. Verse 5 through 8 are contrasts between living in the Spirit and living in the flesh. Now, now I understand there are those who, who and, and in my own life, I'm like Paul when I say that the good that I would do, I don't do. That which I would do, I don't. But that which I would not do, I do daily. What a wretched man I am because there's still sin in my life and, and we're going to address that in, in a minute. But this contrast is not the contrast of the Christian living a, a life in the flesh and the, in the spirit. This is contrasting those who are Christ's living in the spirit and those who aren't who are living in the flesh. Those who are Christ's followers who have been born again, if you will, in the Spirit, and those who are trying to live their life without God's Spirit in the flesh. When we're without Christ and when we're in the flesh, we live for the things of our flesh. We see that in verses, verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. You know, our main thoughts are to satisfy our desires and appease our senses. I don't know about you, but uh, as we've been through all of this uh, lockdown, this uh, uh, quarantine, my senses have, have, have been heightened toward the things that, help my body that will satisfy my flesh, especially things like chocolate chip cookies and banana bread and and, uh, brownies and ice cream, all those things. I I have found that I'm wanting more of those because, you know, they satisfy the flesh. There are other things that we do to satisfy the flesh, whether we, we tend to be selfish even when we're doing things for others. You ask someone why they're doing this and why they're doing this good. Well, I want to make the world a better place. Why? For my children. I want to make the world a better place. They will tell you they're trying to make things better around them. And that may not sound selfish on the surface, but it is. When we're walking according to the Spirit, we have our minds on the things that matter to God, the things of the Spirit. You know, those things are are like developing the fruit of the Spirit. We're developing that fruit of the Spirit that the Spirit places in our lives. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith gentleness and self-control we're working on on maturing those things in our lives scripture warns us that the mindset of the flesh means death for us in verse 7 verse 6 now the mindset of the flesh is death but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace you know the fleshly mindset is death because it opposes god he goes on in verse 8 to say that the mind, those in the flesh cannot please God. Or verse 7, rather, the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't submit to God's law. It's hostile because it opposes God's law. God gave us this law. 
Not because he wanted us to see if we could live up to it, because he knew we couldn't. He knew that we could not do it because our tendency is to be hostile to him. Therefore, we could not reconcile ourselves to God. We can't please God on our own. We, we, we don't even try to please God our own, on our own in our natural state. We try to please ourselves. And, but God said, if you want to please me, trust my son, Jesus, to get you here. And we say, no thanks, I got this. See, we're free to live when we're living in the Spirit. We're free to live when we're living in the Spirit. Verse 9 tells us that we're free because of whose we are. We're free because of whose we are. It's not because of who we are. It's because of whose we are. Verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. I said earlier we would look at the specifics of what it means to be in Christ Jesus, and here we are. Jesus, before he went to the cross, was speaking to his closest disciples, and and he was telling them that he was sending his Holy Spirit. And he said this about our relationship to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verse 17, he says, He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Too often we tend to minimize the spiritual aspect of truly being a Christian. We we being a Christian is so much more than just a decision to follow Christ. You see, there's a spiritual aspect to it. We Jesus described it as being born again. Jesus describes it as having our sins forgiven. It's described as his Holy Spirit coming to live in us, sealing us until the day when we are made whole and we can see him face to face. And because a little later in chapter 14 of John, Jesus says, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the whole Trinity within us. We receive the Holy Spirit, not as a second work, but as the the moment we trust in Christ. We don't have to have special evidence of the Spirit outside of the fruit of the Spirit. That is the evidence that God has given us, that God produces in us. And that Spirit seals us. It seals us. It puts God's seal on us, that seal of approval. Not only does it say that We are safe, but it says whose we are. Because we're in Christ and he is in us through his spirit, we have freedom from worrying about ever severing that relationship. It's impossible. We have freedom from ever having to worry about are we good enough, smarted enough, talented enough for God to love us. Because he loves us. Not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. We are in Christ Jesus. However, it says, and listen to this, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you don't have God's Holy Spirit in you, then you need to trust in Christ because you don't have Christ in you. Finally, we see that we're not totally free yet, but we will be. We're not totally free yet, but we will be. We know that we have eternal life now. And it's the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Let me back up. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit gives life 
because of righteousness. Not our righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. We know that we have eternal life because we have Christ in us. We have his righteousness. Not this self-righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. And because we have Christ's spirit in us, then even though our mortal bodies may die, God will raise us up one day with new bodies that will never die. This corruptible, made-to-die body will be changed for one that is incorruptible, never able to die. Charles Spurgeon, who in commenting on verse 1 wrote, My hearers, we are each of us by nature under the condemnation of God. We are not only subject to condemnation, but we are condemned already. And on account of sin, there is judgment recorded in God's book against every one of us considered in our fallen state. But if we are in Christ Jesus, if we are made partakers of Jesus, we, if we have hidden ourselves in the cleft of the rock, Christ, and if our trust is solely in him, O precious thought, There is therefore now no condemnation. For us, it is blotted out. Is your condemnation blotted out? How can you know if it is? What do you live for? Do you live for the things of God through His Spirit, or do you live for yourself and the things of the world? Let me plead with you to trust Jesus and allow His Spirit to help you to live for the things of God, then you're going to know true freedom. Please, if you want to know more, call or text the number that is on the screen right now. I would love to talk with you more about your freedom and my freedom in Christ. We've come to that time where during this time we pray for our leaders and our uh, government. Things are opening up. Uh, things are relaxing. People are, are, we're seeing more and more people out doing things. We need to continue to pray for protection. Pray that this virus doesn't become what we were afraid it would become at the beginning as a result of the opening up. We need to continue to pray for our leaders as they make decisions. I ask you to pray not only for your president and and, and for your governor, but also your church leaders, whoever they are. Because we're all making decisions about opening up one way or another. I want to tell you that we're looking at that day also, and a decision is coming. So watch. Watch. Watch our Facebook page. Won't you pray with me? Father, you are the God of glory, and we thank you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the freedom, the freedom that comes through your Holy Spirit living in us. Father, I pray for those who don't have that spirit, who don't have your spirit in them, that they would today trust in you trust in your son jesus christ and what he did on the cross quit trying to live this performance-based life where where they're trying to be good enough or talented enough or smart enough to please you father help us to realize it's not our righteousness but it's the righteousness of your son jesus who died for us that you're looking for in us. Lord, I pray that you would draw those who don't know you to you right now. Father, I pray for our leaders. I pray for our governments as as they are looking to open up. God, I pray that you would give them your wisdom. I pray for our president and for for our our go- Congress and those who advise them that you are giving them uh, wisdom and knowledge. 
I pray for our governor and that those in our state houses and our city leaders and, and county leaders. As they are all looking at what this opening up means, I pray, Father, that you would just give us wisdom. Lord, I pray for the pastors and church leaders who are struggling, Father, over the best way to regather. Help us, Father, to know your will in this. God, thank you for your protection. I pray for those who lost loved ones during this time for whatever reason. For, Father, it seems that because of this, we've not been able to mourn properly. God, I pray for those who have loved ones in the hospitals and nursing homes. I pray for those who are in the hospitals and nursing homes, that you give them your healing. I pray for their families, that you give them your strength. Father, you are the God of glory. I thank you most of all for your son's life and the freedom from worry that we can have when we put our trust solely in him. For it's in the precious and holy name of our sin sacrifice, the precious and holy name of the one who died for us, the precious and holy name, the one who lives today and is at your right hand. King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for, for watching. Thank you for participating in worship. As I said, watch our Facebook page. We'll be making some announcements. Uh, church, uh, I'll be sending out texts. Let me say this. If you're watching and are interested we do continue to have small groups meeting on Monday nights. Our children's Sunday school uh, is meeting. We're calling it our, our Gospel Project Bible Study. Meets on Monday nights at 6.30 on Zoom. This is an invitation only. So if you're interested, call this number or you can go to our website and you'll see a link for Zoom where you'll have a form that you can fill out and it will uh, come to me so that we can get you in on that Zoom. On uh, Wednesday nights, our middle schoolers and high schoolers are meeting the same way, by Zoom, on invitation. If you have a middle schooler or a high schooler that would be interested, let us know. If on Thursday nights, our children get back together again for a time of activities uh, with our children's minister. So uh, if, uh, again, that's by invitation only. And just before this, on, at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, our adults gather for Sunday school. Again on Zoom. Please let us know if you're interested in any of those small groups. Thank you again for listening, and God bless.